Today I'll be speaking about the ceramics and chronological relationship between the lowlands and highlands of ancient Edom for the multifaceted Edom conference. Excavations carried out by the UCSD LRAP and L2HG projects in the lowlands and highlands of Edom in southern Jordan from 2002 to 2012 have uncovered an extensive assemblage of Iron Age II ceramics spanning from the 12th to 7th centuries BCE. One of the most highly debated subjects since excavation began at Herbert and the Haas has been the dating of the lowland sites, especially in relation to the plateau sites at Bucera and Tawilan and others. Prior to excavations at Ken, all sites excavated on the plateau were dated to the Iron II BC period, roughly 8th to 6th century BCE and even later, primarily based on comparison of ceramic assemblages with Cisjordan and North, Northern Jordan. This changed after surveying excavations began at Ken, and we began to report of the finds, stratigraphy, and ceramic corpus coming from the site. We published shortly after the first season of excavation a corpus of absolute dates that all fell within the 10th to 9th century BCE, with no attestation of the later Iron II BC periods. Following this initial report, there were contested views of the RC dating, and there were several reinterpretations of the Bayesian modeling, either trying to push Herbert and Nahas into the Iron I or into later periods or both. We are fortunate today to have several of the scholars that have been involved in this debate, and my hope is that this talk will clarify the chronological relationship between the lowlands and highland sites, primarily by focusing on the ceramic assemblages, which tell a clear and consistent story. Notably, that the lowland sites of Herbert and Nahas Rujim Hamrif Don sounding A, Herbert El Duria, and even the earlier house structures at Barca have a consistent ceramic assemblage that we can count confidently date to the Iron, a, Iron Age 2A period and should not be confused with the later Iron 2BC Edomite assemblages on the plateau or Iron 1 Cisjordan forms. Here in this isometric view of Southern Jordan, you can see the primary sites excavated by the LRAP and L2HE teams. Much of the focus is centered around Herbert and Nahas, but what I want to emphasize from the beginning of this talk is that our understanding of the ceramic dating comes from the intrasite analysis of all of these sites you see here. In particular, today, I will start by looking at Rujim Hamra Ifdan, which I've argued in the past is the linchpin for understanding the chronology and social boundaries of the region. RHI is a very small settlement when compared to Ken, Kaj, or really any of the other sites. However, it is significant in that we have the presence and clear distinction in one location of both these time periods. It allows us to typify these two periods and then compare them to the Highland sites and Lowlands for us to very clearly distinguish between the Iron 2A ceramic assemblages and what we see in the Iron 2B C periods. What I'd like to do is use RHI as a case example for addressing the question, can we distinguish based on ceramic assemblages alone, the Iron 2A assemblages from the Iron 2B C periods in ancient Edom? There has been significant rhetoric made by Finkelstein and others that the RC dating has influenced our dating of the ceramic assemblages. I would like to emphatically state and show through this paper that this is definitely not the case. Rather, the RC dates only have confirmed what we have seen in the study of the ceramics since we started excavations. As a final note, so that there is no confusion on my bias, since the beginning, I had hoped we would discover more clearly an Iron One presence at Ken and these other sites. Similarly, I have no objection to Ken being occupied in later periods. The problem is that through my extensive analysis of the ceramics and also corroborating evidence in RC dates and small finds and everything, I have not seen any evidence that provides a, any support for a late, later Iron 2 BC period at Nahas or some earlier Iron 1 date. So today we'll focus on Rujim Hamrifdan and bring it back in comparison to Nahas and other sites. So Rujim Hamrifdan was first identified by Nelson Glick as a Nabataean watchtower, but he also identified Iron Age pottery at the site. It was later surveyed by the Signas team and the Wadi Fudan surveys and dated to the Iron II period. Rujim Hamrif Don is located around five kilometers southwest of Korbet and Nahas on the northern bank of Wadi Fudan at the entrance of the southern approach to Wadi Al-Khweba. 
The peak of Rujamhamrifdan site is situated on a tiny fragment of the Pleistocene conglomerate that rises above the Wadi bed and stands as a small island on the edge of the Wadi, making an ideal control point for the Wadi Fidan and entrance into the Wadi Elk Wave. The top of the hill is completely eroded away, although it is clear from cut wall stones in the Wadi bed that there once was some form of small structure on the hilltop, possibly described by Nelson Glick as the watchtower. Ceramics are everywhere on the surface. We conducted two soundings. There were they, these were very strategic, focusing on two clearly separatable periods of the site. From the above figure, you can see that sounding A is tucked away in a natural overhang of the site, while sounding B was conducted at the base of the hill. Here are two photographs of the two soundings. As you can see, sounding A is tucked under the shade of the upper portion of the conglomerate. Once removing the topsoil, we immediately hit a dense, silty ash layer, and the ceramics and fines on the bedrock appeared to be consistent with what we were seeing at Harbat and Nahas. Similarly, we found all the typical material culture as at Nahas. The mix of handmade wear, and real made metallurgical activities, if not tertiary, the ceramic sound was also very similar to what we experienced at Ken. And we excavated the bedrock and exposed two enclosing walls constructed on top of the bedrock. We excavated sounding B, which is a later site, directly below sounding B at the base of the hill. From sounding A to B, there is a wash in the topsoil of massive amounts of pottery, all of the later pottery. All of it is consistent with ceramic forms found in this Iron A to B C period. We selected B because it appeared to be a butt up against a retaining wall and have collected the wash of all the pottery, perhaps thrown or eroded down from the base of the mountain. In contrast to sounding A, sounding B was filled with hundreds of shirts, small finds, and etc. You could tell almost immediately that the ceramic assemblage was different and much more abundant. We excavated the bedrock and saw no change or occurrence to the type of mature culture in sounding A. So sounding B, completely different occupation, no earlier period of occupation at the site. And we excavated to bedrock in both locations. RHI has two clearly distinctive occupations, and the later inhabitants show no presence or disturbance of the earlier rock shelter occupation. Most likely, the sounding B occupants occupy what Nelson Glick identified in the early 1900s as this washtower and perhaps conducted some agricultural activities in the fertile wadi beds as witnessed by agricultural retaining walls that we found during our survey. However, despite the abundance of ceramics in sounding B, not many individuals could have occupied the upper area. If there is any place to get a grasp of what a small, perhaps ephemeral, insignificant occupation in the Iron Age 2B looks like, it is sounding B. Here's just a couple images of just the different um, parts of the site. This is up in sounding A. On the left, this is down in sounding B. What I like to start with is discussing in 2016, I published all the work done in Archive, and unfortunately it's not figured into the debate of distinguishing between these two periods. And uh, I want to highlight before discussing the dating of the soundings by ceramics, that there are ways to date and ways they should never be conducted. And unfortunately, um, much of these bad practices have I've seen in the recent publications by TVs and Finkelstein and how they're trying to um, pigeonhole dates of ceramics to specific periods. Number one, we cannot assume that all ceramic forms have short horizons. In fact, the opposite is more the case, that morphological ceramic forms often span centuries. In the Southern Levant, this is a well-established fact, and no one would question the dating of the stratification layer of a form in a later period having to be represented in it earlier. Only ceramic forms that can be clearly identified as having short horizon, horizons should be used with this binary presence-absence type of dating. Rather, we need to count and measure statistically the presence of forms. More often, we will find sporadic appearances of a form in an earlier period that then becomes dominant in a later period and then slowly dies out in the following century. One of the major problems with excavations and publications in Southern Jordan was there were no statistical measure of how dominant a certain form was. One could only deduce from the plates published what seemed more abundant to the archeologists, but this is not especially helpful to understand what are the dominant forms of period that typify that period. Finally, if the only analysis and comparison made is based off the appearance of the ceramic profile in published plates, you're bound to make all sorts of mistakes. 
And most of the work by these others are just basing their interpretations off of the plates that they see, not on the ceramic, on the ceramics, not on the fabric, not on um, close up examination of the forms. Besides short horizon forms, the most clear indicator of rapid change in a period of storm assemblage is the introduction of new technological changes. And of course, the most classic example of this in Cisjordan is the emergence of red slip hand burnished wear, and then it's fast replacement to even burnish and wheel burnish red slip. It's these technological changes, and this is something I'll be highlighting in this talk, that allow us to see very clearly the distinctive periods. Um, but even better than painting approaches and new firing tech new firing techniques and changes in production standards really um, allow us to be able to make these clear distinctions, not only in the morphology, but in many of the other developments that happen in later periods. And so it's these new forms, these new um, technological changes that are produced that are really the best indicators for us being able to distinguish these things. More, as I like to say over and over again, morphological form, unless it's a short horizon, it can span centuries. And so we can't use that to pigeonhole a date of a site. So leaving out six and seven, which are also very um, well-practiced methods of dating ceramics, but because of the arguments that we're using RC dates for our analysis, we're not gonna use those two examples here today. So summarizing here are the primary observations that we made between the iron 2A. So starting with Rujam Ham, Hamra Ifdan sounding A, which is the upper earlier site. The first indicator of its earlier period in association with the Iron 2A sites at Can and Kaj is this handmade wheel mail presence. Similar to these sites, handmade wear made up a significant percentage of the ceramic assemblage. In this case, 58% of the assemblage. And also number two, similar, similarly consistent with Kaj and Ken, RH, RHI has a very low count of pottery. We have to imagine that the Iron 2A8 is the beginning of the ceramic adoption in the lowlands. There are no Iron 1 or late bronze precedent for ceramic production, and it is what you would expect if the inhabitants of the lowlands were starting to change cultural life ways towards a more sanitary lifestyle. Comparing the amounts of the, to the single 5x5 five five meter square of Rujamhammer sounding B, sounding B has eight times the amount of diagnostic pottery. In our study of Ken, we have over 3,000 indicative shirts, which is a statistically large sample. But this is from multiple seasons, six areas, and many five by five meter squares. While in comparison to one square excavated in Sounding B, where we had 848 indicative shirts, um, it's clear that in the later periods, we have this abundant production of ceramics, while in the much earlier periods, um, that are represented at Sounding A, Rujam Afdan, at Herbert and Nahans, at Herbert Algeria, the production just wasn't as extensive and it wasn't as standardized. And we just don't see the same amounts of pottery as we do in the later periods. Number three, another clear distinguishing aspect of the ceramic assemblage is the many different forms that have direct parallels to Ken and Kaj and nowhere else. So for example, uh, number one is bowl 3B, uh, which has um, a typical white slip on the interior and exterior. And this bowl is ubiquitous at Ken. For those that are not familiar, it is one of the telltale examples of Edenite pottery, but not by morphological form. The form is found in Cisjordan Iron TA through, and through 2C. But the distinguishing difference is that the inhabitants of Southern Jordan decorated them with the famous black bands on the inside and strokes on the rim. Um, here's just a couple images of this, and you can see those black bands and strokes on the rim. Now, you notice that this form has a triangular rim. It is not everted. In fact, it is folded to give it a beveled lip. This is, however, not the most common variant in Ken or RHI. RHI has two more undrawn versions that are bowl 3A. The main difference is that bowl 3A are smaller, thinner, and quite often just have a simple rim, only slightly thicker than the profile of the rim, of the rim lip. Um, and here's some more examples from Herbert and Nahas. And um, uh, here are the examples from the Iron 2B period. And these are examples coming from Lily Silly, Silly Ovitz's work, um, where um, um, from Kardesh Barnia. And you can see that the later forms, they maintain the, the painting styles of the white strokes but the bowls are much larger. 
They have much thicker rims and quite often they're everted, as you can see um, in uh, figure four um, and figure six. So even though they, uh, in the earlier periods, we have these triangular section rims that um, we do see kind of progress into the later periods, but get much bigger, much larger diameters, much thicker walls. Uh, we also have the emergence of these more everted rim types um, that uh, are not present at all at Rijim Hamrefton or at Harbat uh, Nahas or any of the other sites um, in the Iron to A period. So this, so we can make a very, in one of the most classic examples of what we are calling Edomite pottery, we can make this very clear distinction almost immediately between what we would call the triangular section rim bowls of the early Iron to A and those of the Iron to B. Um, here's just some examples of what these bowls look like uh, from Bucera. Um, and you can notice that um, in Bucera, there's not only a development in the morphological shape of these vessels, but also the painting becomes much more elaborate. We don't have any of this type of elaborate, uh, multicolored uh, painting like you see for figure nine or figure eight or figure five. So really the painting uh, development of the what we call the bowl 3A and the iron 2B becomes much more elaborated, much more developed. Um, so really like we can see these clear distinctions. We don't see any of these type of developed painting styles on these type of bowls in the iron 2A. The second form uh, uh, that I like to discuss, um, and of course we don't have much time is uh, bowls uh, 17, 22, bowl 35, all of these bowls um, uh, are attested in iron 2A, so they don't find, so they're not problematic. But in Tevis's most recent 2021 article, he accepts our identification of these forms, um, but he adds to the list um, several other forms, uh, such as Pithos 5, uh, which is a color rim jar, as being these later forms is just completely incorrect. Um, we have at uh, Rijim Hammer Iftan bowl 30s, which is a cup variant of bowl 20. And it's very clear that there's clear differences between these type of vessels and what we find at Herbert on the Haas. Um, I would like to talk about another um, vessel that is used by Tibes and Finkelstein to say it's a mix of later periods into the Haas. Um, and that is jug three. And we see jug three at sounding B, Khobrit al Rujim Hamar Iftan, clearly in the late Iron 2B period. And jug three, there's two different forms. And the jug three that's identified at Khobrit and Nahas is not the same as what we see at any of the, of the Busera or Tawilan or Rujim Hamar sounding B sites. It's different. Jug three which I'll show you here. This is jug three, which we identify at Herbert and the Haas. And it's also found at Rijim Hamrafdan sounding A, um, is a unique form that has a ridge below the rim. And that's what was described for the jug three of the later Bucera periods. But um, there are some significant differences. First of all, all the forms found at Hen, which amounts to 14 out of the 15, are of a particular fabric called the Dissi Formation form fabric fabric, which is a highly siliceous wear that when fired creates this white, beautiful pottery. It is also the same wear that is most abundant among the um, K8 craters at Herbert and the Haas, which are only attested at Herbert and the Haas and Herbert Algeria. So we have a specific fabric that we can say is specific to the Iron 2A that we see in the crater 8, which is unique to Nahas is the same as what we see for jug three, which only appears in the iron 2A. So this identification of jug 3A as a lay period is completely false. It's completely wrong. Um, and uh, not only is it wrong morphologically, but it's wrong once you look at the fabric, it's different. When you look at the sounding B of Rijim, uh, Hammer of Dawn, which is a later period, and what we call jug three, the morphology is very different. Um, First of all, um, the rim is um, ridged and attached. And I will show you a picture of that. Do we have that? Um, let's see. Oh, uh, yeah, on the right here. So if you look on the right, you can see what the ridge rim of the jug three that is 
um, dating to the iron 2B period, you can see that the ridge is attached to the rim. It's not separated from the rim. And it's very different in even the construction. You can see that the, the ridge rim jugs that we have at Herbert and the Haas, um, it's almost as if they um, um, just took a tool and made a groove below the rim that created that lower ridge. Well, it's completely different in the way it's constructed for um, these later periods. Um, the other clear distinctive part is the fabric. When you look at the fabric that's described for Bucera or what we found at Rujam Hamar Ifdan um, or at the other plateau sites that we excavated since, such as Khurbet um, al-Iraq, um, Jinabia, um, these sites, the fabric is completely different. No longer do we have any presence of this dissy clay. Uh, rather, instead, they're the particularly for these vessels, they use this greenish white fabric. It's lower Cretaceous stale shale. It's a local fabric. It's very common. Um, but um, these vessels have this typical greenish white color and pale gray core. But it's a completely different fabric from what we have of the jug threes in the iron two a period. So there's clear distinction. So um, what we can conclude from just this analysis is that when we look at any of the morphological forms identified by Finkelstein as being iron 2 BC, um, it's really, those are completely incorrect. Um, we can tell both morphologically and by the fabric that really they are specific to the iron 2A or um, the forms that he is trying to identify as the later forms, they're completely different in morphology or in shape. I don't have time to go into all the different examples that Finkelstein gives, but I think two of the most important ones which is bull 3A and uh, Jug 3, it's clear that these are separate periods and um, Ruja Hamrafdan and Khurbet and Nahas have these and they represent the Iron 2A period, not the 2C period. So um, I would like to finally conclude by just discussing a little bit more about what are the, uh, what is I think the most key distinguishing factor between the Iron 2A and 2B that we see at Rujim Han Rifdan and then can be compared to Herb Den Haas, and that is um, the fabric and manufacturing technology. Rujim Hammer 78's wear is identical to what we see at Ken. We have both the common lower Cretaceous sail origin and slag tempering with several of the diagnostic vessels examined. The fabric is especially of the finer wear is softly pore sorted and not highly fired. And the fabric and the quality manufacturers immediately distinguishable between what we see at Sunny A and Sunny B at Rujam Hamar Don. At Sounding B at Rujam Hamar of Don, um, we see um, that uh, there is a continuation of the use of, of course, the local lower Cretaceous shell fabrics. However, what becomes readily clear is that all the ceramic forms are much more well sorted and are fired at much higher and evenly distributed temperature. The core is evenly cooked with a consistent color throughout and rarely porous. And in general, all the ceramics are incredibly hard and strong compared to the Iron 2A ceramics found at Ken or Rujam Hammer if Don sounding A or at Catch. This becomes very clear to me while I was preparing thin sections for all these sites. I could not cut many of the Iron 2P vessels using a standard Dremel saw. I had to use a diamond plated saw to be able to cut through these because they're so hard, so well fired, so well sorted to produce a very strong and uh, technologically more advanced type of ceramic rather than what we had in the Iron 2A periods. Another clear indicator of the technological advancement between Iron 2 and 2B is the standardization of the manufacturer as well. At Ken and Catch and RHI, as we already mentioned, um, not one vessel is dimension-wise or morphologically the same as another. So um, it was actually quite a difficult time typifying the forms that we found at Harbat Nahas or Rujam Ham Rifdan or Kaj, because even though we could say, yeah, this is all bowl three, or this is all jug three, or this is all the other vessels that we had, every single form was slightly different. They, they deviated in their diameter. They deviated in exactly how the rim was treated. But this is completely different when we look at the Iron 2B to C period at Rujam Hamrifdan and at other sites. We have many forms, such as the Bowl 3s, Bowl 20, carinated bowls, the cups, the incised cups, many of the jugs, and the abundance of cooking pats. 
and all of them share the exact same diameters and forms of within the, their groups. They're very well standardized. This is completely different. And we can see that this is another technological advancement that happens in the iron 2B, 2C period um, and is another indicator that we have these clear distinctions of these periods. The only, only form of pottery I've seen that comes close to this level of quality um, of what we see, like for example, the bowl 20 of Sandy B is what we see in the, even the later periods of uh, the Nabataean period. I mean, bowl 20, which is probably one of the best, most beautiful vessels that we have, and we have them abundantly in the Iron 2B period. Um, these are these fine ware cups and fine ware bowls that are beautifully painted, they're fired, they're metallically hard. Um, we don't see anything like this. Um, occurring in the sounding A of Rijim Harmafdan or Chobet and Nahas. And it's clear that there's no mixing here of these periods. Um, so um, to conclude, I would just like to highlight these main points. Um, we can make some conclusions about the differences of the ceramic assemblages, the iron 2A and 2B, and bring back to this to bear on whether there is an iron 2B presence at Ken. There are six lines of evidence that support the differentiation of the ceramic assemblage that can be extracted from these two soundings. None of these require us to, use, to look at the RC dates or small finds, but it's been continually argued they corroborate the conclusions of what we saw from the RC and small finds. Turning to Ken, in order for there to be evidence of an iron 2B presence, we should expect to see at least some of the iron 2BC indicators as reflected at sounding B, such as we should not. We should see this abundance emergence of wheel made and very lack in the stratigraphy of handmade. We should see a huge increase in the amount of pottery. We should see um, many of the other parallels that aren't even represented appearing in the plateau and the negative sites. We should see the painting and decoration styles that we see in these later periods. We should see the fabric and manufacturer technology styles. We should see. Um, we should see the presence of these. And similarly, we should see the disappearance of all of these other indicators um, that clearly place Herbert and the Haas in the Iron 2A. So um, the forms that can and the later sites must be older because they are seen in the older sites. This breaks the established understanding. This so um, what I'd like to conclude is that the chronological debate or the dating of the lowlands to the highland ceramic assemblages has probably been focused on reinterpreting the excavations at Ken from and ignored the abundance of data collected over the past two decades at the multiple surrounding sites in both the lowlands and highlands of Edom, along with the very critical Cisjordan and Negevite sites such as Kadesh Barnea and Timna. When we turn reflectively back on Ken by comparing it to its contemporary sites at Kaj, RHI, as we've done here, and even Timna and Barka, which uh, later uh, Russ Adams will discuss, the original arguments and dating made by the Fisher are corroborated. There is no strong evidence supporting an iron 2B occupation at Ken, and we don't need the RC dates to make this conclusion. It's clear when we look at the ceramic forms, when we look at the fabrics, when we look at the technology involved in the development that occurs in the later 2BC period that does not have any evidence or presence at Herbert and Nahas. I've taken as an example, Rujam Hammer Efton sending A's and B's to delineate the clear distinctive differences between these two periods. The ceramic differences of this period is not just morphological, but can be seen as development of painting styles, standardization, and the production manufacture. Alongside this, we see the shift in technology. We see the abandonment of the handmade wares, the rise of the ridge rim cooking pots, and almost a closing off the local communities from their neighbors in the importation of potteries. One thing I didn't have time to discuss is that another corroborating evidence we see in sounding A at Rijam Hamar of Don is we have the Korea ware, we have um, at Herbert and Haas many different imports that are clearly iron to A periods. None of imports that would be representative of the later periods. Um, and the interesting that we see thing that I have seen at our excavations on the plateau at the four different sites, Khorbet al, al um, Iraq and uh, Kiss and these others, along with Rijim Hamar of Don sounding B, there are no imports. 
Um, so almost there is this disappearance of importing of pottery into these small into these settlements. And maybe because these were villages, they weren't significant sites like Bucera. But what we do see in the sounding in uh, in the Iron Two B.C. period, which is well attested in the Negev, is now all of a sudden uh, there is a trans a change from instead of lots of imported pottery coming into um, these Edomite sites, we see a lot of the styles, a lot of the forms of the Edomites going out of that area into the Negev sites, which we know um, to happen to be um, belonging to different people groups in the Edomites, or maybe there's some Edomites living in the area. But clearly we can see in the later periods, the forms are going out rather than coming in. So, Rujam Hamarf's sounding B is really a linchpin, not only for understanding the distinctive images of the Iron 2B, Iron 2A from Iron 2B in the lowlands, but is also one of the few excavations in the lowlands that allows us to make comparisons with the highland sites. Beyond the publications of Pusera, Tawilan, and Umal Biara, we have used the L2HE sites that were excavated with extreme precision to build strong statistical comparisons of these highlands in relations to the lowlands. Thank you.